Well, good morning. I um, I don't know that I've ever been any more <clears throat> like nervous and excited all in one as to be preaching uh, this morning. Uh, a couple of reasons. One is we're starting a, a new sermon series, and um, it's called Battling Unbelief. And it's one that um, that actually, I'll, I'll say this, that if... Uh, if the if the stream tastes uh, tastes sweet, like consider the source, like it'll even be sweeter. That um, in, in the words of my grandfather, that we preach the best sermons um, that money can buy, which um, means that this sermon series is not original to me. Pause. Let me put on my timer. Um, not that it means much. Promise you. I'm gonna try not to. I'm gonna, I've, I've built an off ramp. You know how like when you when you're traveling down to Florida and, or South Carolina and you go down the hills. There's like those off ramps that they've built for semis to get out of control that just kind of is a, like a gravel pit that goes up. Like I've built one of those in my sermon. So if this semi gets out of control and I look down and it's, uh, it's, it's getting late, <laughs> then I could just drive off onto the ramp, all right? So if I, so if I end abruptly, that's what's happened. Um, so, so anyway, this sermon series is a sermon series that actually John Piper preached in 1988 which means that half of you were in your diapers when John Piper killed this sermon series. So just think about that, that nothing new under the sun. Um, I I wasn't even a believer yet. And so in 1988, uh, Piper at Bethlehem Baptist Church preached this series called Battling Unbelief. It's a series that uh, I've listened to these sermons um, since I found them, I I don't know, probably six, seven years ago, I probably listened to them 10 times. Um, Some of them, maybe even more. And it's one that I've wanted to share. It became a book called Battling Unbelief. Um, it actually was, worked its way into another book as well. And so I've just been um, just desirous to teach this to us and for, this to be, uh, for, for us to be challenged by this. Um, let me just preface everything in this series by saying this, that while I was in, uh, while I was in Haiti for uh, like 18 days, which is, seems like, it's like times two when you're in Haiti, you know, that's how, how slow time moves when you're in Haiti, felt like I was down there for a stinking month. I mean, it was great with the, with the baby. Was all, all that was great. Great time with family. Great time with uh, my kids most of the time, right? Uh, but it was still, man, it, it's, in, it's, it's Haiti. And so while I was down there um, in the mornings, I was reading um, the book of 1 Corinthians. And it had been a while since I read 1 Corinthian. Now, 2 Corinthian, I read it all the time. But 1 Corinthian, I hadn't read it in a while. And so I was reading 1 Corinthian, and I was just noticing that, that I read Paul's letters o- often, and so, like, one of my DNAs were in the book of Colossians. Another one of my DNAs, we just finished up uh, a Titus. So we did 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. And so I'm constantly in Paul's writings and letters, but I was just noticing the contrast in 1 Corinthians versus all the other letters that it seems that Paul's written. And there's just, like, a, a, a lack of, of spiritual depth. There's a, there's a lack of theological density in 1 Corinthians that's in all of the rest of his letters. And Paul states why he has to write it. It's because the church in Corinth couldn't handle, like they couldn't handle the truth, right? Like the, you, you remember that. They couldn't handle the depth. And so like in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says to them, like, I had to, I had to approach you as children, as infants in the word. I couldn't feed, I had to feed you milk. I couldn't give you solid food. You'd Basically what he's saying, you'd choke on solid food. So I had to give you milk to treat you as, as infants in the flesh, not as spiritual. And so I want to preface this by saying that um, I really believe that this series is spiritual in nature. And my prayer as, as I approach this is my prayer is, is that we're, we're not infants in the, in, in the Lord. That I know some of you have been saved for a short time, but I pray that, that you're desirous of truth, of, of, of God's truth in such a way that, that, it, that it doesn't um, ruffle up your flesh, this is what Paul writes in the Romans, the eighth chapter, is that the, the flesh, the mind that's set on the flesh, it cannot submit to the things of God. It, it, it will not, that it will not submit to it. It can't hear the things of God, that it, that it, it ruffles that. And so my prayer is, is that this wouldn't ruffle you, but this, my prayer is that this would grow you. It's my prayer that this isn't something that you would just set aside or you would miss or you would dismiss. But this series is something that would, that would grow you. It would grow you deep in the Lord and deep in his word. And so um, if, you, if you have your Bibles, keep them out. We're gonna get to, we're gonna get to Romans 4, but we need, to, we need to lay a groundwork. But let's pray before we get there.
just praying for that very thing that we've just spoken of. Heavenly Father, we approach you realizing that we all, at one time, we were in the flesh. And we even regarded Jesus as just in the flesh. But you've worked through the power of your Spirit to regenerate us and make us new, to give us soft hearts. You've beckoned to us. You've said that those who hunger and thirsty to come to you and they would be filled. And Lord, this morning, I ask for my prayers that we would come to you as, as hungry folks desiring to be mature, desiring to grow. Our prayer is that we would seek you, seek your spirit, that your spirit would give illumination to your word and enlightenment into our lives. That what we do here isn't just to be left on some spiritual level, but what we do here should permeate every portion and every fiber of our lives. That as your word declares that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, We want to taste that freedom. That freedom isn't just locked up in our justification before you. It isn't just found in our spiritual salvation, but may that freedom, may it flow into every facet and into every piece of our lives. That may your glorious gospel, may it be the clarifying truth of every portion of our lives. May it speak to every portion. May it feed every portion of our lives. Set us free today. Often we find, our, we find ourselves just locked up in, in negative feelings and in negative emotions that rob us of our joy, that rob us of the fruit of the Spirit. And I pray that you would, you would illuminate the truth as to what causes that. We would get beyond just fleshly causes, but we would dig deep into the root, the root of unbelief, and you would teach us in that. <laughs> For your, it's for your fame that we pray this. It's for as we've sung, it's for your renown and for your glory that we're called to be a city on a hillside, a lamp that's been lit, illuminating your glory. And I pray that, that this sermon would, and this series would end for that. In your name we pray, amen. So I think we need to maybe start here. Um, <clears throat> battling unbelief, the premise of this entire, I think, seven or eight week series that we're going to be on, the premise of this series is found in this statement, that God's desire and design, I think we could even say demand for us as his church, not for the world, but for us as his church, is not just to believe in him, but to believe him. And there is a drastic difference in the two. That God's plan, what he wants for his children, one of the reasons why he is showing himself powerful and as a savior to his children, isn't just to result in us believing in him, which means to acknowledge him and his existence, or even to just acknowledge certain doctrinal truths. That that is faith, but that is the faith of the demons. That the demons believe in God and shudder, James 2.9. But what God's desire for his church and for his children is for them to believe him, to place our trust and our confidence in him and in his promises. That the rhythm of the Bible And it's found in Romans, the first chapter. So we're in Romans 4, but the rhythm of the Bible is um, found in Romans, the first chapter. And it says this, that the just are called to live by faith. The just are called to live by faith. And it's not just faith in the existence of God. 
It's not just faith in our justification or in our salvation, but it is also faith in our daily living. That we are to live by faith with an element of certainty, of assurance, of confidence, of trust in God and his promises over every aspect of our lives. You still with me? So let me say everything that I just said in a totally different way and even make it more practical, I hope. That the opposite of faith is unbelief. That's the opposite of faith, it's unbelief. But it is not unbelief in the form of atheism or agnosticism that we must battle. But it is unbelief in the form of anxiety, Fear, jealousy, bitterness, lust, impatience, at all. That's what we're battling. Not just agnosticism, not just uh, 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 unbelief that avails itself in atheism, which is forms of unbelief. But for us as a church, the unbelief that we battle shows up in, it manifests itself as Anxiety, jealousy, lust, bitterness, impatience. And so what we're going to do is this week we're going to look at what unbelief is. That's what we're doing now. We're going to look at the example of faith from Romans 4. We're going to speak about how do we battle unbelief. And then what we're going to do next week, we're going to talk about how do we battle unbelief together as a church because it's not just something you're doing. This is something for the church, and the church is a people, not a person. It's a people plural. And so how do we together as the church, how do we battle unbelief in even, even in each other's lives? And then from then on, we're going to look at each one of these aspects of a manifestation, a fruit, a form of unbelief. And we're going to talk about it in a very specific way, how do we battle that thing? So the life of faith, where Paul tells Timothy to fight the fight of faith, And so we're calling this series Battling Unbelief because that's the opposite side. We battle unbelief as we fight the fight of faith. And daily we are battling unbelief that feeds itself in negative emotions, negative feelings like anxiety, jealousy, bitterness, impatience, things such as that. That if we were, uh, in fact, if you have your Bibles, flip over there with me to, to Galatians. I know we're in Romans, and we'll get there. But look also just at Galatians. I think, I think one thing we have to be careful of as the church and as the people of the church is that we don't, is we don't draw two major distinctions and say, okay, I have my real life, right? That's me getting a job and going to work and feeding my family and deals with my health and deals with my, you know, 401k and deals with, right, my my Chevy that hopefully it starts. And then I have my church life, my spiritual life over here. And that's me being a good guy, me going to church and occasionally reading the Bible and occasionally, like that doesn't exist in the Bible. There's your life. Right, And also what we have to be careful of is we don't think, take things that are spoken about in the Bible, such as anxiety, and say, okay, no, no, no. Anxiety just deals with this over here. It doesn't deal with this over here. So, so the church, ha- worry, you can speak about, pastor. Preach all day long about worry. But anxiety, now, no, wait, now that's a disorder. That's a, right, and I go to see my doctor about that. Like two things we got to be careful of is one is, is drawing those distinctions and say that there's nothing spiritual touching my anxiety, my worry, my impatience, that's all physical, right? One thing we have to do. The other thing that me as a pastor, I have to be careful of is to know that, like, can our bodies, right? Can our bodies get out of sorts, right? Something go wrong in your body, producing or not producing something, and it be something chemical inside your body that, honestly, I, I, like, you know, Dang it, Jim, I'm just a pastor. Like, I don't know about that, right? I don't have a, like, I can't write a prescription. I didn't go to, a, you know, like, like last week or two weeks ago, I think it was, while I was in Haiti, the little time hop thing on your Facebook, 
you know, comes up. Mine came up six years ago, and it was a picture of me in a sewer ditch, right? Like six years ago, I was laying pipe in a ditch, right? Five years, you know, five and a half years later, here I am, like, preaching, right? Just knowing my role, but also knowing, like, where the Bible speaks, like, we're going to look at where the Bible speaks. And so what I'm saying here is whenever we speak about anxiety, I know some of you, like, have a tendency to, okay, shut him down. He doesn't know what he's talking about, right? It, it's, it is both. It's physical and it is spiritual. And we're going to speak about those sorts of things. And so what you have, look at, look at this in Galatians 5. Um, look at verses 22. Starting verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So here's what Paul's preaching here. This is what Paul's teaching the people is that whenever you got saved, you received the Spirit. And as you receive the Spirit, that the Spirit in you is producing this fruit in you. And this is the fruit that should be produced in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, what kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, I think sometimes we think of the fruit of the Spirit, for those of us that have heard this before, we just think about it in terms of evangelism. Like we challenge each other with the fruit of the Spirit to say, like, you need to live that kind of life because that kind of life is very contagious to outsiders. And as they see you being a person who is full of love, person full of joy, a gentle person, then they're going to be compelled to come to Christianity. And that's true, and we should be. But I think also we kind of forget that there's a very practical sense in this, that this is a good life that we can enjoy. Now, I want to be careful that I'm not just preaching from pragmatism here, saying like, well, this is very pragmatic, so we should do it. What I'm saying here is that it's very practical. Like, I think about uh, Chuck and Becky Adams, two, two members, and they've got this, uh, they, they bought a house and a little farm, and they inherited, or not inherited, but they received on their house and on their farm two things. One was an apple orchard, the other was a cemetery. Right? It's two things they didn't put there. It was put there before, but as they moved in, they get a little apple orchard in the back, and then over on the side yard, they got a cemetery. Now, I don't know about you, but the cemetery wouldn't be all that welcome, but I'd love a little apple orchard. All right? And so each year, apples all over this tree. Well, guess who the first people are that enjoy the fruit of those apples? Chuck and Becky. They go back there, and they reach up, and they pick an apple off that tree. I'm sure they do. They, they eat that apple and they enjoy that, right? I'm sure Becky makes Chuck every year, big apple pie, right? All warmed up in the oven, little homemade vanilla ice cream to go on the side, a la mode. I don't even know what that means, but sounds good, right? Sounding good, real good, right? Little pie. Life, this life gets better with pie, right? It's going to be manna, manna in heaven. It's going to be pie. So picture this with me. You got like here, a picture's worth a thousand words. So you've got this, you've got this tree that's you, that represents your life. And I can't, it didn't, this tree here didn't have any fruit on it. So you just got to use your imagination. But there's, there's fruit all over it, apples, whatever you like, pears is on it. And what he's saying is that fruit is that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Faith, I mean, doesn't that sound good? Love and joy in your life. Who doesn't need some of that? Peace and gentleness. Like, I want to be married to that person, right? I want to live with those folks. I want to go to church with those folks, man. And I want to experience that in my, I want to experience that in my own life. But in this tree, the roots of this tree, they grow deep. And what they're growing deep in is, is in faith. See, it's like the spirit. Is, is taking the faith of the, in the roots and, he's, and, and he, he's distributing it, right? Like if I knew anything about trees, I could use like some terms here, you know? But he's distributing it throughout the tree to the branches so that it now is an experience of the tree. It's an apple tree. And we know this from scripture because like in Galatians 3, what Paul writes, he said, you know, how did you receive the spirit? Did you, receive, did you receive it by works of the law or did you receive it by hearing that comes through faith? See, faith is how we experience the spirit and it's what produces the tree. Now I want you to picture another tree. In fact, we'll put one up, an old dead tree. You know, like all the ash trees around here. 
You know, get, get, got the, the boars in them, right? Killed them. Done sp- choked them out. What is it? Girdled them. That's what Bill Jones says it's called. Got, got all girdled up all the trees and it's killed all the ash trees, right? And the branches of this tree didn't produce any fruit, but the branches of this tree is anxiety and impatience and fear, right? Misplaced shame, worry, condemnation, things like that. And this tree has within its roots, not faith, but unbelief. So the other tree, deep roots in faith, when the storms come, when the winds assail, when the rains beat the tree, because of its deep roots, the tree stands. Deep tap root down into faith. But this tree, in unbelief, branches break off and they break things. So what we want, what we desire is to, in this series, is to grow deep roots down into faith, into faith of the Lord. So how do you battle unbelief? How do you fight the fight of faith in just very practical ways? Let me give for you, you can write these down on the back of your skinny, but let me give these to you. This is what it looks like for us. It's when you experience something contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. All right? When you feel, when you experience something contrary to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control, when you feel anxious and fearful and condemned and bitter and angry and prideful and brash and impatient and downcast and jealous and envious, when you feel that, when you're experiencing that, then you need to try to discern what unbelieving thoughts or fears or beliefs are producing this. What unbelieving thoughts, fears, beliefs are producing this. Never leave it just on the surface. Dig down deep. Don't just leave it in the branches. Try to expose the root of it. And then second, go to God's word. What is a specific promise from God found in scripture that you can turn to that speaks speaks the truth to that unbelieving thought, fear, or belief? So we have for us, God by his grace has given us his word. And in his word, there are specific, there are blood bought purchased by his son, promises made to the believer. A promise to save you. Scripture says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I just don't feel very safe. I just don't feel very secure in my salvation. Well, did you call upon the name of the Lord? Is there any evidence? Is there any fruit of that calling in your life? Did you turn to him in faith? A promise to be with you. Jesus says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. A promise to keep you. Now to him who is able to keep you, to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. A promise that all things are working for your good and his glory. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. A promise that he won't condemn you, those of us in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A promise of grace in our suffering and our weakness. Paul writes that that he hears from the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. A promise that our suffering is not in vain. Paul writes that this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. He writes in Romans 8, if we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. We take that promise and then we believe that promise by faith. We believe that. We, in the words of John Piper, we bank our hope on that promise. We pray that promise. And then lastly, we act on that promise. In fact, 
what we're going to couple with this sermon series, and I think you receive those in your skinny, is these little cards. And each week that we're in Battling Unbelief, you'll have one of these cards with a verse on it that'll be in your skinny. And we, I sell this from John Piper, but these are going to be called fighter verses. And they're verses to equip you to help you fight the fight of faith, to battle against your unbelief. And so what we want you to do is to take this card and put it in a place of prominence. It's a great idea. Simply take it, take your little smartphone, snap a picture of it, and then take your cat off of your lock screen and put this on your lock screen, right? I know your cat's cute, but like this will equip you. So every time you turn your phone on, it's no longer Mr. Kibbles that's on there, right? It's now this verse. And try to commit this verse to memory. Try each week for the next seven weeks to memorize one passage of Scripture in that week. And so these fighter verses are there for that, for you, because they're going to help equip you in the battle. They're promises of God, blood-bought specific promises of God that will help us battle against our unbelief. Now, what we've got in Romans 4 is we see a picture of that. But even for us, I mean, like, like this is what we have to do. Like what I'm preaching here, the reason why I've listened to this series so much, the reason why I want to share it with you is because this is our present experience. I mean, even for me today, like I battled anxiety like like maybe never before. I don't know, there was earlier times about battling anxiety that was really tough. Like this preaching up here is, is difficult for me. That I know like when you see me, like I seem like a nice guy and hopefully that I am a nice guy. But like, I gotta be honest with you, I'm far more introverted than I am extroverted. That in fact, like when I take that little quiz, that I'm a reluctant extrovert that I like people, but it's gotta be small groups of people in certain scenes. Like, I don't like to be the guy in the spotlight. Like, I'd rather have you over in my house and me grill something for you, or you buy us a pizza and let's sit and talk and play a game and then me talk about stuff like this in that context rather than me being up here and all you folks looking at me. Right? Like, it causes me great anxiety Like I feel the pressure of preaching. Like I want to be a man that's rightly dividing God's word. Like the last thing, the thing I probably fear the most is me saying something that would detract from the glory of God or saying something that isn't congruent with God's teaching. And so sometimes that causes great anxiety. I got to study this and I got to read this and I got to think through this. And then what am I going to say? And what am I not going to say? And what if my fly's undone? And what if... You know, all of those anxious, I thought you was like it was code for it is, and it's not. (laughs) All of those anxious thoughts. And then I've been out for three weeks. So it's like, do I remember how to preach? I haven't done it in three weeks, the longest break I've taken in the five plus years that I've been here. It's like, do I remember how? And I just, this week, just feeling anxiety, anxiety, anxiety about it. And I want it to be good. And I want, and then what I had to do is I had to grab a hold of a promise. And for me, it was a promise, same promise that I've already given to you. It was a promise that my grace is sufficient. That in your weakness, I made strong. But the Lord likes me weak. So if there's any power in the pulpit, it's God's power, not my power. He likes me fearful. But he's going to work a great work. So I believe that promise. Your grace is sufficient. Your power is made strong in my weakness. I believed it. I prayed it. And then I acted upon it. I got up this morning and I went through my morning, Sunday morning routine of prayer and finishing up my sermon notes and working on the slides that are going to be up there and took a shower, you know, amen, right? Ironed my shirt, showed up, 
didn't run. <laughs> Came up on the stage when it was my time. I'm letting God work. It's the same thing you have to do. When you feel anxious, fear, or jealous, or impatient, or bitter, or condemned, And what we have here is the perfect example given to us in Scripture by a man by the name of Abraham. And so back to Romans 4. So Abraham is a man just like we were men. He was born a long time ago that this is actually from the book of Genesis. But Abraham's a man just like we are. Abraham's a man, not perfect. He makes mistakes, does some dumb stuff. But he's a man of faith. His faith is something that we even see as you read the book of Genesis. You see something that he grows in his faith. And he comes to, to, to a place where Paul's going to use him. As Paul speaks about faith, Paul's going to say, hey, here's an illustration. Because he's, he's writing to mostly a Jewish audience. So he's saying, hey, here's an illustration for you guys that you guys are going to get. Let me use this illustration for whenever I speak about faith. Here's, the, here's, the under, here's a man by the name of Abraham. And so what Paul's writing about here is he's writing, writing about the faith that justifies Now, certainly in its context here, what Paul's mainly speaking about is is faith. It's it's by faith that justifies us, that saves us. It's in faith alone, right? This is is a text that the Reformers, in the book of Romans, that the Reformers grabbed a hold of to say like, hey, you know what? The church needs to be reformed because we're missing it. We're making it all about works, and it's not about the law. It's not about works. It's about faith. It's about grace. And so we need to reposition what we believe about, about, uh, about salvation on this. But it's also more than just that. It's an example of faith. That what he says here about faith is not only true for our justification or salvation, but it's also true for us living, for us battling, for us surmounting obstacles in our life. And these are the things that we learn in this text. Let me read just a portion of this text to you again, starting the 17th verse. He says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. So what's happening is, we'll pause here, just to, for those of you that may be, not be familiar of the story, but God shows up to Abram when Abram, first time, Abraham's about 75 years old. And God says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm gonna make you the father of many nations, plural. And Abraham says, uh, God, we got some problems here, right? Number one problem is I don't even have a son, let alone many sons, to produce a nation. So you, there's your first problem you're gonna have here using me. Second of all is I'm 75 years old right? There's some, right, you all track it with me, some physical problems right there, being 75 years old. Third problem is, is my wife is just as old as I am, right? And her womb has been barren for 75 plus years. So you've, you know, not picked the best, you know, plan here, or the next best subject for your plan here of creating many nations. And so that's kind of the story, but of how Abraham had to believe God from 75 here, where, where Paul picks us up, he's 100. For some 25 years, Abraham's believing, trusting, maybe even longer, trusting in God's promises before God finally produces a son. His name is Isaac. And so uh, he's the child of the promise. And so that's, that's the story. So let's, let's look at this. I forget where we are. All right. As, <clears throat> he says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of, of God in whom he believed. This is, this is Abraham now. He believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now, this is Paul's notes that he's making here. This is the God that we serve. The God that shows up is the God who has the power. That's what you gotta believe. He's got the power to give life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist both the physically dead, okay, you're no longer breathing, no more brain waves, because that's what he does in his son, and also those that are dead, meaning that he's just not physically able to produce children. But then look at verse 18. This is Abraham. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. He was 
fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him was not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So a couple of points we want to bring out about this text and about faith. Number one is faith is based upon the promises of God found in his word. What are we called to believe? What are we banking our hope on? Not on what we want. Pause. Not on what we want. Not on what our hope of our desired outcome is. The object of our faith isn't us. Do you know all things? Do you do all things well? I mean, think about your past, right? Certainly, you can think about a bad decision you made, right? I'm going to drink that whole bottle of tequila. Here we go, right? Good decision, bad decision, (laughs) right? Bad decision. Do you do all things well? Right? I got got talked into by, by a gentleman who's here this morning. I got talked into buying a new vehicle one time, a vehicle I couldn't afford, right? Like, I couldn't afford it. Went and bought it, got home, you know? You you go through the honeymoon phase of getting that new vehicle, you smelling it, loving it, rubbing on it, and then, like, you know, like, two months later, that payment book comes, and you go, like, I can't afford this. I look at Lou, and I'm like, what have we done? And she goes, like, it's you, boy. You know, I try to tell you, you wouldn't listen. I just... Submitting, like Scripture tells me. (laughs) Sometimes God calls you to submit to an idiot. That's what I did. We don't do all things well, right? Seven years to, I couldn't even, I I couldn't, I didn't pay that vehicle off. Three vehicles later, upside down, upside down, upside down. We don't do all things well, right? So it's not based upon our limited perception of what we think is well even when it seems very obvious that this is what is best. We don't know what is best. We got to believe that God is leveraging everything. Even our suffering, he's leveraging in that somehow for our good and ultimately for his glory. That our, the object of our faith, what we're banking this on is upon the promises of God found in his word. We're called to believe his word, believing his promises, not what we conjure up, not what we hope for, but we're believing the promises of a loving father has made to his children. So we see in this text, God made the promise to Abraham. Abraham, I'm gonna make you the father of many nations. His promise was not about Abraham, but it was about the glory and the plan of God It's about God create, not creating a lineage for Abraham, but it's about God creating a people for himself, even in this. This has very little to do with Abraham. This has everything to do with God's salvation of his people. I mean, that's Abraham, Isaac, all the way down, and you get Jesus out of that that ultimately the fulfillment of the plan of God creating many nations isn't wrapped up in Isaac. It's ultimately wrapped up in the church, standing before a lamb in glory, singing hallelujah, and us singing that he has purchased with his blood men from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. That's the ultimate fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham. It's very little to do with Abraham's little limited perception, but nevertheless, he trusts God. God's working through weak, seemingly impossible circumstances in a weak vessel named Abraham, and that's grace. Abraham trusts the Lord. Abraham's faith rests entirely upon the word of God and nothing whatsoever else. It's all he's got. God's word, but it's enough. 
Faith that glorifies God means possessing a humble confidence, banking our hope in the promise of a God made in Scripture. That's what brings God the most glory. That is the goal. Not your peace, not your comfort, not your joy. That those are just byproducts of our confidence coming from God. For confidence of God working all things together for his, our good, his good, and his glory. So just byproducts of all that. Abraham has nothing to go on here except a mere statement of God. And that is faith. Faith doesn't ask for proofs. It doesn't seek them. It doesn't need them. Faith is content with the bare word of God. Number two, faith is future-oriented. It's future-oriented. We said that in the text where it says, so shall your offspring be. That's future That's not current. Currently, I don't have a son. That's right. I understand that. But so shall your offspring be. That there is a time when we think about this, we were to put this on on, on a timeline, even within our own lives, that there's there's a time when we're when we're when we're trusting. There's a time when we're believing. There's a time when we're banking our hope in God, and then there comes a time of fulfillment. Right? There's a time when it's no longer by faith, right? It's now by experience. Last night, well, actually for the last three days, anxious, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like the time of faith is no longer here. It's now a time of experience where I'm now preaching, feeling the power of the Spirit working through me, right? Preaching it, no longer as anxious as I was, now past that, now it's now an experience that I'm having. All of you, there's, there's a time of it meant suffering, but yet, okay, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be confident in God that he's working this together for his good. So I'm not going to feel fearful. I'm not going to feel scared. I'm not going to worry about that. And then you die. And it's no longer faith still, though. If you were a believer in Christ, you now step over into glory, what we're all hoping for, right? Like, like that, the, what's one thing that God taught me while I was in Haiti, my whole experience with my, with my daughter? It's this one thing, is this isn't heaven. This is a Haitian orphanage. In fact, we've said this week about things here in this life. Hey, it's not, it's not too bad for a Haitian orphanage. Hey, we really enjoyed tonight playing cards with our kids and eating a good meal and all that was enjoyable. Hey, that's not too bad for a Haitian orphanage because that's really what this is, that there's coming a time when we'll be in heaven where our citizenship rests, where, our, where, where it's no longer to be about faith. It's now gonna be about experiencing, experiencing the glory as we just sung. It's going to become a time we're going to see Jesus as he is and just in seeing him in his glory, we're going to be transformed into people of glory. Like that's what we're banking on. That's what we're hoping on. Not our perceived outcome. Ultimately, what we're banking and hoping on is seeing and being with Jesus. That's what it's all about. And so there comes a time when it's no longer about faith. It's now an experience. But what faith does, biblical faith does, it's why you're here, ex- not divorced from the experience on some regards. You're divorced from it. What faith does is it goes and gets the confidence of the experience, the emotion of the experience, and brings it over into the present. You tracking with me? Like I'm visual. You, you, you see that? So what you have here, hopefully, for me in my preaching, it's not that I feel anxiety but I now feel confidence that the Lord's with me. Confidence in this, even though it hadn't happened yet, I feel confidence. I feel, I feel peace. I feel assurance. That my grace is sufficient. My power is being made working in your weakness. I got it, you're weak, but my power is being made strong in that. But it just doesn't future-oriented, but it also bases itself upon the past as well. The faith looking to the future, grabbing, those, grabbing that confidence, grabbing that, those, those feelings, grabbing all that assurance, bringing it into the present, but it's being supported on works of the past, namely the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
And we see this in Romans, the eighth chapter, in a very profound way. Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. An event in the past. God didn't spare his own son. Gave him spot. He gave him, he gave him up for us all. So then he says, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? See how grabbing this, supported by the past, that's faith. Faith produces hope, confidence, and assurance. So we see in Abraham, he hoped in hope he believed against hope. No, verse 20, no distrust made him waver concerning the promises of God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That Abraham believed the promise totally on the word of God and also in spite of all appearances to the contrary. That Abraham considered the facts. It's not blind faith. It's not faith that refuses to face the facts. I know some people think Christianity is a bunch of jokers that we get in a dark room, we draw the shades down, then we pretend that bad things aren't really happening around us. It's not escapism. That isn't what he did. He considered the, the facts. I'm 75 to 100 years old. Sarah's womb's barren. She's as old as dirt as well, right? You know, I don't have any children. He considered the facts. Facts, the circumstances, the difficulties did not trump the promises of God. No distrust made him waver. The problem with unbelief is that it only looks at the difficulties. It only looks at what is the seemingly facts. It doesn't factor in the power of God. It doesn't factor in a loving God. And then here's the key in the text. He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. As he, what this means by, by as he gave glory to God, is it could mean a couple of things, and I think it probably means both things. It's one is as he, as he glorified God, as he praised God, right? As he, as he, as he, as he just, God, you're, you're glorious. God, I'm, I'm, this is about you, not about me. They gave glory to God, but second, as he considered God's glory. The first, as he gave glory to God, so he, he's thinking about, he's looking upon, his gaze isn't fixed on this, his gaze isn't just horizontal, his gaze is vertical towards God, but then also as he considered God's glory, as he thought about God and who he is and how he works. See, this is where things like tonight's course seminar become so important. Like tonight, five o'clock, right here. We're gonna move all this. Gonna set up some tables. Gonna have a whiteboard up here. We're gonna teach from God's word. Tonight, what we're teaching is the attributes of God. And this is where the attributes become so, so important that they're not just doctrinal truths that we believe, but they have, a, they, they, they bleed over into our real life experiences. That is Abraham considered God as being powerful. We're gonna talk about that tonight. So he considered God being sovereign. We're going to talk about that tonight. As he considered those things, he grew strong in his faith. His faith was enabled him to endure. He didn't just consider the promises, but he considered the promise keeper. See, ultimately, even in this, we're not banking just on the promises. We're ultimately banking on the promise keeper. As I was in Haiti, and I had to leave my little girl in Haiti, girl that we've already like fell, fallen in love with. So many of you, you're like, man, those Facebook posts or those videos, like I already love that girl so much. And like, I hear you, like you should have been there. You should have seen her, should have smelled her, just seen those little curls in her hair. She seen that little voodoo glance that she gave her brother, you know, put it on you. The, like, it's like the force or something. Ooh. You should have seen that and you should see... Like all of that, and then knowing that we're going to leave her in an orphanage in Haiti, we're going to come home, 
We're going to do a bunch of paperwork. We're going to do all this. And then in a year, a stinking year, we're going to go back down there and we're going to get her and we're going to get to bring her home. But knowing how tough that's going to be to look at her and put her down in that orphanage and walk, turn around and walk out. Knew it was going to be tough, right? Pretty strong fella. Knew that was going to be a hard one. And so leading up to it, all that I had, I found a, and a source of comfort was to just say promises from Scripture to her as if I was making them somehow to her. So I'd look at Sapphira and I'd say, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan, but that he's going to come get you. Because it's the same thing Jesus told his disciples. I told her, I said, we're going away, but we're going to go away and we're going to prepare a place for you. It's going to be a room. I mean, she doesn't understand anything I'm saying. I just, my prayer has been that this difficult thing would be sanctifying for me. It wouldn't just be something that I do her on a fleshly level, but it would be something that grows my faith. And so I say to her, we're going to go. And we're going to prepare a place for you so that where we are, you can be with us. And then I said, Sapphira, these light and momentary trials that you're going to go through, man, they're not even worth comparing what it's going to be like when we get you home, girl. And then on Thursday night, the last night, when we were, actually it was on, yeah, Thursday night, our last night in Haiti, we'd already uh, packed up. We were getting ready to leave. And I, uh, I just had this overwhelming sense of my powerlessness to keep any of those promises. We're another earthquake away from that not happening. Earthquake in Japan, earthquake in Ecuador. When's it going to hit in Haiti? And if that earthquake hits, they'll shut it down. Thought like Haiti can just shut down adoptions in general. Couldn't get it. Couldn't happen. Just thought of all of the things that could happen. that would keep us from being able to bring that little girl home. And I know what you're thinking now. So Andy, what promise was it that you banked on that assures you you'll get to bring that baby home? I don't have one. There's not one. That God in his sovereignty and in his goodness, he could plan for us to go down there and attach and love that child and come home and us never get to bring her home. That don't make sense to me. I don't understand that. But that doesn't change the fact that he's sovereign and good. That what all those promises made to me was all it did in that moment, it underlined my powerlessness. But the promises that God has made in Scripture are not made by a powerless human like ourselves. But the promises that God has made in Scripture are made by a powerful creator, God, who today is sitting on a throne upholding the universe by the very, by, by the very power of his word. And I found my comfort, even though I couldn't turn to a passage of Scripture, other than God works all, to get all things together for good for those that love him, but sometimes my good isn't necessarily his good. But just resting in who he is, that no matter what, death, persecution, suffering, nakedness, famine, that none of those things will separate us from the love of God. And see, there's some of you in the room that you're like, believe in God? Believe in God when I feel anxious or fearful or scared or there's too much month at the end of the money or the 
transmission goes out of the Chevy or kid gets sick or tr- tr- like believe in God in that, like believe God in that. I can't, I can't even believe in God. Like I'm battling with agnosticism. I'm battling, battling with this. And let me just say this to you. What may grow you in your faith is when you believe God in those circumstances. Now you gotta have a baseline level of faith. Writer Hebrews writes that, that faith, the very foundation of faith is to believe in God, believe that he's good. So you gotta have some foundation of faith. But what really will grow your faith isn't just ascribing mentally, acknowledging certain doctrinal truths, but what's really gonna grow your faith is when you believe him in the circumstances. Because the primary component of Christianity is an acknowledgement. It's love. We're not calling you, I'm not calling you to believe in a doctrine. I'm not calling you to believe in a statement of faith. I'm not calling you to believe in a confession. I'm calling you to believe in a God who is a lovingly, a loving heavenly father. And because of that, we trust him. We believe him. He is our confidence. He is our hope.